Welcome back, everyone. Today we're going to be uh, really focusing on something something that's super important uh, in the world of wildland firefighting. Yeah. We're going to be taking a look at uh, how long it takes to get an injured firefighter from, you know, way out in the field, mm -hmm. sometimes miles from a road to a hospital. Right. And uh, to do that, we're going to be kind of going behind the scenes uh, of a new research model that can actually predict those evacuation times across the whole u.s the contiguous u.s yeah for the whole lower 48 pretty cool huh it is it's really neat it's all about you know taking this information and then uh using it to make better decisions to uh ultimately keep those firefighters as safe as possible exactly and um the source material for this deep dive is a 2024 research article uh, it's a really in-depth article uh, that was published in Fire Journal, mm -hmm. uh, and the title of it is uh, Wildland Firefighter Estimated Ground Evacuation Time Modeling to Support Risk-Informed Decision-Making. A mouthful. A little bit, yeah. But uh, we're going to unpack it. We are. And I think you guys are really going to find it fascinating. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things I noticed right off the bat is um, why are we focusing on ground evacuation times specifically? Well, you know... Sometimes a helicopter just isn't an option, you know? Of course. Uh, you have to think about remote locations. You might have uh, bad weather. Yeah, you might not have the resources. You might not have the resources, exactly. Mm -hmm. So all of these things can can actually ground air support. Yeah, absolutely. And when every minute counts, right. knowing how long that ground evacuation might take yeah. can literally be the difference between life and death. Yeah, that's a powerful thought. Yeah. It's a really powerful thought. Um, so, okay, so we know, you know, why it's so important, but like, how did they actually, like, how did these researchers go about figuring this out? Well, they really looked at three main factors, hmm. hospitals, uh, road networks, and off-road travel. Okay, so break those down for me. Okay, so starting with hospitals, they use something called the Homeland Infrastructure Foundation Level Data, uh, we'll call it HIFLD for short, okay. to map out over 5,000 hospitals across the entire U.S. Wow. But not just any hospital, right? Okay. They focused on those uh, specifically equipped to handle the unique needs of uh, injured firefighters. So yeah. things like, you know, burn units, trauma, Sorry. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, in the HIFLD, those are categorized as general acute care and critical access hospitals. Gotcha. So location is key. Of course. Making sure that an injured firefighter can get to a facility yeah. that can actually, you know, help them. Treat them appropriately. Treat them appropriately, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that's hospitals. What about road networks? Road networks, absolutely. And I imagine that's super important. Oh, incredibly. So yeah. they factored in road type uh, speed limits, accessibility, you know, all of that. Yeah. They even used a, a data set from 2020. Oh, wow. Okay, so pretty recent. Very recent to capture any of those recent changes, right? Makes sense. Because road networks are always changing. Yeah. And those updates can really make a big difference yeah. uh, in those evacuation time estimates. Absolutely. Okay, so we got hospitals, we got road networks. And now this is this is the part I'm really excited about is yeah. the off-road travel. Off-road. Because, you know, that's that's where it gets I'm real chill, yeah. in wildland firefighting. Right. Right. How do you even begin to model something as complex as that? I mean, you're talking about like dense forests, steep slopes. Maybe you're carrying an injured colleague. Yeah. Streams like there's just it, it's a whole other ball game. The list variable. It is a whole other ball game compared to just you know driving on a paved road. Right. Yeah. So they had to you know get creative. They uh, they broke it down into some key obstacles that can really affect that travel time. Okay. So, for example, the steeper the slope, mm -hmm. the slower you go, especially uphill. Yeah. Like, duh, right? Mm -hmm. But in this model, any slope over 45 degrees, uh, that was considered completely impassable. Wow. Okay. So... Yeah, I mean, already we're seeing how terrain is, you know, such a huge factor. Absolutely. Uh, what other what other things did they consider? Well, land cover is mm -hmm. a huge one. So think about, you know, how much harder it is to move through a, a dense forest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Compared to like a wide open field, right? Yeah, completely different. So this model actually estimates that forests can slow you down uh, like four times. Wow. And... You know, it's not just forests, right? Like even the type of vegetation matters. Mm -hmm. They use satellite imagery to look at shrub density. And what they found was, you know, low density shrubs, those might actually be a little easier to navigate than we thought. Interesting. Whereas high density shrubs, forget about it. Yeah, it sounds like a nightmare. It's a major obstacle. 
Wow. Okay. So even just like that, something as, I don't know, like seemingly small as shrub density can have a big impact. It can. Yeah. And then what about those like little rows or trails that, yeah. uh, that maybe vehicles can't access? Right. Right. Like a little dirt road or something. Exactly. Do those, do those factor in? Absolutely. Even if an ambulance can't drive on it, you know, a trail can still really help a firefighter who's on foot. Yeah. Trying to get out of there. It's like a shortcut. It's a shortcut, exactly. Yeah. And let's not forget about all the down trees. Oh, yeah. All the debris. That's like an obstacle course. Oh, like imagine trying to, you know, scramble over all that. Right. Um, they even factored in uh, how many streams a firefighter might have to cross. Oh, wow. Really? Because even, you know, a little stream. Yeah. Can add precious minutes to that evacuation time. Yeah. It all adds up. It all adds up. I'm, I'm starting to, like really get a sense of just how many factors oh, yeah, yeah. there are at play here. It's it's so much more than just distance on a map. It really is. And each one of these factors, like from the slope of the terrain to the density of the vegetation, mm -hmm. can really impact how long it takes to get someone to safety. Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. So yeah. like after crunching all this data, what did the model actually reveal? about these evacuation times across the country? Like, is there is there like a national average or does it vary? Well, that's where it gets really interesting. And that's what we're going to be talking about in our next section. All right. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back after a quick break to dive into the results of this model and uh, what they mean for keeping our firefighters safe. Okay, so we're back, and I'm really dying to know what this model tells us about, you know, actual evacuation times. Like, were there any surprises when they crunched all that data? Yeah, well, nationally, the new model actually predicts slightly faster evacuation times um, on average than the older model. Oh, interesting. So that's, I mean, that's good news, right? It is, it is. But um, here's where it gets really interesting. There's a lot of regional variation. So some areas actually saw increased evacuation times. Really? So like, why, why is that? Why are some areas seeing these, these longer times? Well, there are a few reasons. You know, think about things like hospital closures, uh, especially in rural areas. Yeah. You know, that, that unfortunately yeah. happens like... more than we'd like. And, um, you know, fewer hospitals just means longer travel distances. Simple mm. as that. Right. And um, then you have to think about changes to the road networks. Oh, yeah, of course. Like new construction. Yeah. That can sometimes lead to detours or slower speeds, yeah. especially in areas that are prone to wildfire. Mm -hmm. So even something as simple as like a change in speed limit can impact those estimates. Wow. So even with this, you know, really sophisticated model, we still have these like real world changes on the ground that can really shift things. Oh, absolutely. What about what about the places where it, you know, where the evacuation times actually got faster? Like what's driving that trend? Well, um, one example is Northern California. The model now predicts faster times there, and that's likely because of new hospitals being built. Oh, OK. And added into that data. So, you know, improved access to those medical facilities. Makes a huge difference. That's a huge difference. Yeah. Exactly. And then you have areas where um, changes in the vegetation are playing a role. Changes in vegetation? Like, how so? OK, so let's take the southwest. Overall, evacuation times tend to be faster there um, just because of the sparse shrubs. OK. But there are these pockets of really, really dense chaparral. Oh, yeah. And, and that can slow things down, like, significantly. Yeah, of course. So um, the model takes all those dense patches into account. It gives us a much more accurate picture of those potential evacuation challenges. Wow, it really highlights how much location matters. Like you could have two areas that look similar on a map, but you know, those little differences in terrain and vegetation can can have a huge impact. They can. Um, speaking of real world scenarios, how did the researchers actually test the accuracy of this model? Well, they took a deep dive into nine real world wildfire incidents. Oh, wow, okay. Um, these incidents happened between 2007 and 2016, and uh, and they really wanted to compare the model's predictions to what actually happened on the ground during those incidents. Smart. So like putting the model to the test, exactly. yet using using real data. Yep. So how did it hold up? Like, did the predictions actually align with what happened? Generally, yes. Um, the model's predictions were pretty consistent with the reported evacuation times um, from those incidents, which, you know, gives us confidence that that it can be a really valuable tool for planning and decision making. That's really reassuring. I'm sure, you know, that's that's something that firefighters and fire managers are going to be really happy to hear. Do any do any of those real life incidents kind of stand out to you as particularly, you know, 
impactful or memorable? Well, um, one that really comes to mind, one that really highlights the importance of understanding these evacuation times is the 2016 Coyote Fire in Texas. Okay. Um, a firefighter in that incident suffered a punctured Achilles tendon. Yeah. And he was miles, miles from any road. Oh, gosh. So imagine the pain, you know, the difficulty trying to, to hike out of there. Um, it took him six and a half hours. Six and a half hours. To reach help. Wow. On a punctured Achilles? That's incredible. It really, it really underscores that, you know, this isn't just about numbers on a map. This is about real people. Yeah. Facing these incredibly challenging situations. And it makes you realize, like, even the even the most sophisticated model, it's just a starting point. You still need that that on the ground knowledge. You know, you need uh, those real time conditions and you need the judgment of those experienced firefighters. Absolutely. All of that is absolutely crucial when you're making decisions in an emergency. So we've talked about, you know, kind of reacting to these incidents as they happen. But what about what about using this model for like planning ahead of time? Like, is there potential there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's something I'm really excited about. Um, imagine this. You're a fire manager. Okay. And you're looking at a map of, you know, potential fire scenarios. Right. You can actually overlay this evacuation time model and see which areas pose the highest risk for those really lengthy evacuations. So instead of just like reacting to a fire, you can actually use this information to be more proactive about, about safety. Exactly. Exactly. You can prioritize resources, mm -hmm. you can preposition equipment, or even adjust strategies based on those predicted evacuation times. Wow. Okay. So, like, think about things like staging ambulances, yep. prepping those landing zones for helicopters. All sorts of things. All sorts of, like proactive measures okay. that could actually improve outcomes exactly it's like it's like having a crystal ball yeah but instead of seeing the future you're seeing risks you're seeing potential risks yeah and you can plan accordingly and and it lets you have those critical conversations with your team before the emergency yeah like okay you know if a fire breaks out in this canyon we know evacuation could take over four hours right how do we adjust our tactics to deal with that to mitigate that risk. Yeah, it's a huge shift from from being reactive to being proactive, yeah. which which just seems, you know, essential when it comes to to safety. Absolutely. This model seems like it could be a game changer for pre-fire planning. I think so. But is it only relevant to firefighters? Like could this type of information be helpful for for communities in, you know, fire-prone areas? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, if Residents understand how long it might take to evacuate during a wildfire. They can be so much better prepared. Yeah, like helping them make decisions about evacuation routes. Exactly. You know, packing go bags or even just like deciding, okay, maybe we should leave early. Get out of here. Get out of here, yeah. Potentially avoiding, you know, a really dangerous situation. Right, exactly. It, it empowers people to take ownership of their safety. Which is so important. Which is so important in those wildfire situations. And, you know... This kind of modeling could even play a role in long-term land management strategies. Well, that's interesting. How, how would that work? Well, l let's say, you know, you identify these areas mm -hmm. that consistently have long evacuation times. Okay. Maybe it's because of dense vegetation or limited road access. You might decide, okay, we need to prioritize fuel reduction treatments in those areas. Okay. So things like, you know, thinning out the trees, clearing brush, you know, that kind of stuff. So you're not just like reacting to the existing conditions. You're actually like actively managing the landscape. Actively managing. To improve those evacuation times and reduce risk in the long run. Precisely. It's a proactive approach proactive. to mitigating risk on a much, much larger scale. Yeah. And it highlights how research and innovation yeah. can lead to a safer, more effective fire management system. That's awesome. So this model, this model has a lot of applications. Um, but you know, like with any model, it's it's important to acknowledge its limitations, right? Of course. Yeah. You can't just, you know, blindly rely on a model without considering all those real world nuances. So what what are some of those limitations? Like what should we be, you know, mindful of when we're when we're interpreting the results? Well, for one thing, this model assumes that every single pixel on the map is, like, theoretically accessible. Okay. But in reality, you know, there might be fences, private property. Yeah. Uh, maybe even an uncooperative landowner who could create some unexpected barriers. Right, right. Like, real life is rarely as as neat and tidy as a, as a computer model. Exactly. And then, you know, think about the road network data that they used in the model. 
That's that's static data. Right. It doesn't account for things like traffic jams, accidents, oh, yeah. all those other dynamic factors that could pop up. During an evacuation. During an evacuation, exactly, and add significant delays. Right. And and of course, it it's only considering the travel time, you know, not the other things that go into it, like patient assessment, first aid, yeah. um, the time it takes to actually like get someone loaded into an ambulance. Absolutely. So, you know, it's a it's a really valuable tool. Very valuable. But it needs to be used with with a healthy dose of of common sense and, and on the ground awareness. And an understanding of its limitations. And an understanding of its limitations. Yeah. Exactly. It's a it's a piece of the puzzle, not the whole picture. It is. We need to use it intelligently alongside alongside, you know, human expertise and judgment. Absolutely. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We talked about, you know, the importance of this evacuation time, the factors that influence it, potential applications for pre-fire planning, even some limitations of the model. But, you know, the the wildland fire environment, that's constantly changing. Right. And that's a crucial point. Um, it means the data used in the model needs to be updated regularly. Yeah, that makes sense. New roads get built, hospitals close, vegetation patterns shift because of fires. Climate change. Climate change, yeah. It's a it's a dynamic landscape. So staying current with the latest information, that's that's essential for yeah. making those accurate predictions and decisions. Absolutely. And, you know, as technology advances, we can expect even more sophisticated models. Yeah. Um that incorporate real-time data and uh provide even more nuanced insights. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking like integrating weather forecasts, you know, GPS tracking of fire crews. Yeah, that would be amazing. Even real-time traffic conditions all feeding into this model. Right. It's it's like having a constantly evolving picture of those evacuation challenges. Exactly. Now you're thinking the possibilities are, are really exciting. Yeah. But, you know, even with all of those advancements, the human element is is always going to be critical. What do you mean by that? Like, how does how does human judgment factor into all this? Well, even the best model in the world can't replace the experience and judgment of a you know a seasoned firefighter or huh. a fire manager. You know, they're the ones who are ultimately making the calls out there in the field, and they're considering all those factors. Yeah. So it's about using these tools to like inform decisions, not not dictate them. Exactly. It's that combination of data driven insights and on the ground expertise that leads to you know really effective risk management in wildland fire. Well said. Now, before we wrap up this deep dive, um, I think we should take a moment to to just really appreciate the researchers behind this study. I mean, they've they've done some really incredible work. They've, you know, dived deep into this really complex issue and they've created a tool that that honestly have the potential to save lives. Absolutely. Their dedication and innovation uh, are incredibly inspiring. And uh, this work is just, it's a major contribution to firefighter safety. It's a great example of how you know, research can make a real difference in the world. Yeah. But, you know, their work their work is just one piece of this much larger effort right. to improve, you know, safety and wildland fire management. And it's going to take ongoing research, collaboration, and uh, a commitment to learning from past incidents to create a truly safe and uh, effective fire management system. So what are some final takeaways for, for our listeners today? What should they kind of keep in mind as they continue to learn about and, and engage with this topic? Well, I, I think the biggest takeaway is that that evacuation time isn't just some abstract number. Yeah. You know, it has real life consequences, sometimes life or death consequences. Mm -hmm. And and we need to be thinking about it at every level. At every level, yeah. Of wildland fire management. That's a really powerful message and it really reinforces why this research is so critical. You know, it's it's not enough to just be aware of the risks. We need to be actively finding ways to to mitigate those risks and create a culture of safety that that really prioritizes the well-being of, you know, these incredible firefighters who are out there on the front lines. Exactly. And this new model, it gives us a really powerful tool to assess that risk and, and make informed decisions both during an incident and in pre-fire planning. But we also need to keep pushing those boundaries, you know, yeah. exploring new technologies that approaches to to improve safety even further. I love that that forward thinking approach, you know, like, OK, we have this amazing new tool, but but what's next? How do we build on this? How do we how do we keep that momentum going? I can imagine a future where, you know, real time data is feeding into this model and it's giving us, you know, constant updates on things like like road conditions, you know, weather patterns, even the even the locations of the individual firefighters. Now you're thinking that's a vision I can definitely get behind. Yeah. 
And and with the speed of technological advancements these days, it's it's not as far fetched as it might sound. No, not at all. Just imagine the possibilities for for proactive decision making. It's it's pretty exciting to think about. So to our listeners out there, whether you're a you're a seasoned fire professional or mm. or just someone who cares about, you know, the safety of those who protect our lands and our communities, you know, stay curious about this topic. Keep learning, keep asking those questions and and stay engaged in the conversation oh, about wild land fire safety. It's an issue that affects us all, you know, directly or indirectly. And and we each have a role to play in creating a safer future for those who, you know, who risk their lives to protect ours. Couldn't have said it better myself. And before we sign off, a huge thank you to all the wildland firefighters out there. You know, your courage, your dedication, your sacrifice, it's truly remarkable. Stay safe out there. And to everyone listening, thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll, uh, We'll catch you next time for another exploration of fascinating research and ideas. So we've covered a lot, haven't we? We talked about how important this new model is um, and yeah. how it can help us be proactive when it comes to the safety of wildland firefighters. But before we go, like, what are some key takeaways for our listeners? What do we really want them to remember from this dip dive? You know, I think I think the biggest takeaway is that evacuation time, it's not just some abstract number. It has it has real world consequences, you know, <laughs> sometimes life or death. Yeah. And we, we need to be thinking about every that. level at every level, every level of wildland fire management from, you know, the folks on the ground to the folks making decisions, you know, at the at the highest levels. Yeah. And it really reinforces why this research is so critical. It's it's not enough to just like be aware of the risks. Right. We have yeah. to we have to actually find ways to to make things safer. We have to create a culture of safety, one that really puts the well-being of those firefighters, those incredible firefighters at the forefront. Exactly. And this this new model, it gives us this incredibly powerful tool to assess risk and and make those informed decisions both in the moment you know, during an incident, but also before, you know, in that pre-fire planning stage. But I think we also need to be thinking about what's next. Mm. You know, how do we how do we push the boundaries? How do we explore new technologies and approaches to improve safety even further? I love that, that that forward thinking, you know, like, OK, we have this amazing new tool, but but what else? What's next? How do we how do we make it even better? Like I can imagine a future where, you know, this model is being fed by real time data and it's giving us constant updates on, you know, road conditions, weather patterns, you know, even the location of every single firefighter out there. When you're talking, I, I love that vision. Yeah. I mean, and with how fast technology is advancing, it's it's not as far off as it might sound. Right. Think about the possibilities, yeah. the potential there. It's just it's incredible for proactive decision making. Yeah. So to to our listeners out there, whether you're you know a seasoned fire professional or just someone who who cares about the safety of, of these folks who protect our lands, protect our communities, stay curious, keep learning, keep asking questions and most importantly, stay engaged in that conversation about wildland fire safety. Yeah. Stay engaged. It's it's an issue that it affects all of us, you know, directly or indirectly. And we, we all have a role to play in making sure that those who risk their lives to protect ours are as safe as possible. Well said. And before we sign off, a huge thank you to all the wildland firefighters out there. Your courage, your dedication, your sacrifice. It's truly remarkable. Stay safe out there, folks. And to everyone listening, thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll catch you next time for another exploration of fascinating research and ideas.